Yeah, so good afternoon. Um, I'm from NCAR, the National Center for Atmospheric Research, and I run our storage and data services group. So just a little bit about NCAR. We are a federally funded uh, facility, mostly NSF funding. We do get some small funding from other organizations. But the thing that's unique about us is that we're a science uh, specific center. In other words, we don't cater to all of the sciences. We're to pretty much atmospheric and climate sciences oriented. We're run by a corporation of universities, and so there's over 100 member universities at this point that are part of NCAR, and they really dictate what our mission is and what it is that we do. We're established of, of labs. I think we have five different labs. Each one has a different focus, and the lab that I work in is computational and information sciences. And out of that lab, we have a uh, technology research division. We actually have a mathematical and computational group that helps write algorithmics and codes. And then we have our operational group, which is where I work. And uh, we run the HPC facility, and we run um, all of those services. The picture that you see there is our new machine that we're putting in right now. It is about to start its acceptance testing, and uh, we're really pretty excited. It's a, it's a whole new type of machine for us. And then we also have a storage that we purchased as part of that procurement. So that's mostly what I'm gonna focus on. Uh, my group is what we call data analysis services, and we're kind of, I like to say, a split brain group, because I actually have two very different functions. We do the, the operational systems, which is myself and another individual, that we do all of the storage storage systems, our data transfer systems, uh, science gateway support, I.O. solutions, and then I have a visualization group. So it's a little bit of an odd group, but it all comes together very well because the end focus is that we support what can you do with your data after you've produced it. And so we have all of that structure that we do that with. Glade is the environment name that we have. It's a globally accessible data environment. And the whole concept of Glade, we started this probably seven or eight years ago at this point. It's been through its, into its third incantation at this point. And the concept was is to pull the data all together. The data is really what's important in the end result. And how do we make that environment easier for the user? Um, we, for years, had the traditional, you buy a supercomputer with storage, and they were very isolated. And our users struggled, which I'm sure yours have also, with how do I get my data to where it is I need? So we started down the road of this concept of centralizing all of that, and the storage really became the core part of that. So our environment today sort of looks like this, and we support all of the different services that you see, all, everything from supercomputing. The science gateways is another important part of this. We are responsible for a very uh, large amount of scientific data, and so we have services that make that available to the community at large, and that's fed from our large-scale storage. And uh, we use uh, Globus Transfer Services predominantly for that and some of the other basic services. We have everything from analysis visualization, we do remote visualization, to the actual computation that produces the data in the first place. So that's the environment that, that we're responsible for and that we uh, have come to know and love and do interesting things with. So we are a spectrum scale based solution. We've been that since 1999 was the first time that we installed a GPFS solution and we have built on that over the years. So our current system today is about 16 petabytes of usable space at 90 gigabytes a second and that's four years old at this point and so at every four years we do a new procurement and we begin to add to that environment. One of the differences with this centralized environment is we no longer roll that out, the old storage out, and roll new in. We build upon it and we keep that for six to eight years and we start to rotate through things there. So the exciting part is we have our new environment here which is built on a, a 14KXE system and that is gonna be 20 petabytes day one at a 220 gigabytes a second. That has actually completed its acceptance testing. It completed Friday. So that system is now ready to get rolled into the acceptance for the new machine and then into production the 1st of January. The real exciting thing, if you look at the bottom there, is we're already going to expand it. When we designed the system, we bought enough infrastructure that we were only half full with capacity, and we had the ability to simply add disk drives and add that capacity, and we are actually already doing that. The contract work is already ongoing to bring that in. So the spring time frame, we're going to double the capacity of that system. That gets added to the additional 16 that we have today, so you're at 56 petabytes of available storage to our environment. 
This is what we like to build things in what we call scalable units. Everybody has something very similar that they do. It makes it very easy for expansion. If you have a concept of what a component looks like, we can add these on. And so like I said, we this is actually a 14KX embedded system. This is very new for us. We've worked with DDN storage for a number of years, but we've always worked with external servers. And so this is our first foray into the embedded server system. And uh, it's been a very interesting thing. It works incredibly well. We've been very pleased with what we've done. It had a little bit of a learning curve for myself and my other staff member, but um, I think we're going to enjoy this in the long term. Um, one of the things that we do is that we serve data to multiple networks. And so this system, each of the VMs in this system is connected both to an Ethernet network at 40 gigabit and to an EDR network. So we're serving GPFS out to multiple clients and multiple other systems and we can offer that service over two types of networks. So that's been a little bit of a challenge and we've done a lot of work on network design and some of our network routing features that we do to make that work. But uh, this has been a very interesting uh, system to build in this unit and I think going forward it gives us a very nice unit that we can, we can procure and uh, grow this as we move through time. So I've mentioned our, our I.O. network. Um, the Ethernet is very important for our science gateways because they don't have the, the inter, uh, interconnects that the big machines have and being able to have this as a centralized environment, the network really is the important part of this. So we have inf infrastructures that support 10 gig, 40 gig. We can support 100 gig. Our backbone can support the 100 gig. We have not gone there with systems at this point, but we have that capability if we want to. And in fact, the DDN system, the cards that are in there, it's literally a change of a blade in our network switch versus in the system to go to 100 gig with that system. We have a FDR network in our current system and EDR in our new system. Very different network topologies, so you can't mix those two networks together. So our storage is what helps bridge that. And we do routing between the two different storage systems along that system. The design of the environment was intended to be agnostic as far as vendor and, and file system. We can support, uh, we're GPFS today, we've done Lustre systems in the past. We can support both of those to our systems at the same time if we want to do that. So just a pictorial view of that, the core Ethernet switch is kind of the backbone of this. Uh, we run our spectrum scale system on the Ethernet primarily because that helps support all of the clients that we have. Um, we can see data transfer services, science gateways. We of course have a, a very large tape archive to help back all of this up. And then the three main supercomputers that we have today. Um, I think I'll skip past this one because we've already talked a bit about it. Um, the, the key here is that we have some routing code that we wrote that allows us to bridge the two IB networks over the IP network. And that's something that we had to work a lot on to get this environment for this new machine ready. So it's kind of some interesting work. Another unique thing that we do with Spectrum Scale is that we pull our management functions off onto isolated systems. We have found that this helps uh, keep the system a lot more stable. Uh, we have our, in the GPFS world, you have NSD servers, which are equivalent to OSSs, and those servers rarely, if ever, have a problem. They just, they just run, and the management servers can handle all of that functionality. And anything that we have to fix, we fix in the management side, and the file systems are, are available pretty much. We have an over a 99% availability on our, on our file system. So part of it is because we've pulled these management functions off where we can keep those a little more isolated. So this is kind of what our structure of our file systems is heading towards. Uh, we have today, we have our, our IBM system, and we're going to begin to tier that system in with the new DDN system so that we get the benefit of that higher bandwidth that we were able to procure and hide the lower bandwidth now underneath. So as we begin over the next year of our overlap between our two systems to move from the older computers to the new one is we'll start migrating those file systems and those disks in underneath. Another nice thing with this system is we did go with an S SSD layer in here. So, so for most of our file systems, we have metadata on SSD now, and that's something that has been new in this environment for us. We've always used mixed metadata and data. So we're pulling that metadata off now into SSD. And the other interesting thing we did on our home file system there is that's also where we ha have our user local. It's where our applications are. And we pinned those applications in SSD. Since those are predominantly read only and um, just as accessed, it's very rare that we change any of that. Um, that home system system has been in production since this summer and our users have been thrilled because their applications now are, are functioning very well for them, whereas the older system was metadata bound. And so that's been a nice thing there. 
I want to point out the P2 file system. This is where we're actually taking all of our old disk. We have project spaces uh, housed here. We're taking all of that older disk and laying it under the new disk as a tier. And so with GPFS, we have a very rich policy engine, and we can actually allow the file system to decide what data resides where. So we're going to pin all of those um, data collections that we house that are mostly read only. We're going to pin those on the slower storage. And then things that are used less will get pinned on there. And of course, through time, we'll have to figure out what that balance looks like. But um, that policy engine makes that very possible. So after the year overlap, our file systems will be very streamlined. And hopefully, everybody will have access to that, that higher bandwidth performance. And then we'll use the older storage as kind of that, that tier that isn't accessed as frequently. We do make use of multi-cluster, which is a um, really nice feature of spectrum scale, where each cluster is defined in its own little world. And so we can mix and match who can talk to who. There it doesn't have to be a relationship across all of the systems. The only relationship that has to be common between them is my storage environment. So that's been very nice. Um, another nice feature of it is it was when we do maintenance on our side, we can literally block the network access to all the systems so that they're not trying to, trying to do things with storage while we're trying trying to do maintenance actions, and that's been really, really nice for us. So that's just a look at what our multi-cluster environment looks like. You can see that we have seven environments, essentially. And uh, one of the neat things that we did on Cheyenne, which is our new machine, is we actually took the front end nodes, the login nodes, the batch system nodes, and made their own cluster. And they have a small file system to support the batch system so that that cluster can actually remain active and functional while the big storage is offline Users can still be working, they can get jobs queued up, and it'll be ready when the storage and the compute nodes come back online. So that's been another little shift that we've made in our vi environment as we've migrated this to a, a new world for us. So that's our production environment. And very quickly, I just want to go through, we also, of course, have a test environment. So we have something that we call a futures lab. And I was very fortunate this year to get some good funding to build an I.O. lab in there. So I've always had to use old hardware and old storage. I had some old DDN 9900s that I was still using in this environment. And so I was able to get rid of all of that and buy some new, new stuff. And so my group focuses on these areas. High bandwidth networks is really one of our specialties. Parallel file systems looking at the different storage hardwares. We're going to start looking at Hadoop and local storage-based clusters to see if that works with some of the data assimilation work that we do in our codes. Cloud storage is something that we're looking at to host data collections that aren't at the scale of the large ones that we host. The organization has a lot of data collections that are in the 100, 200 terabyte range. And we feel like a cloud system might be a better option for that. And then, of course, if you're going to test I.O., you have to have a compute system to drive it, or there's not much you can look at. So we have a small compute system that we're building. We have this innovation lab in two. Our facility is across two states, actually. Our big facilities in Cheyenne, Wyoming, or the smaller facilities in Boulder, Colorado. So we have uh, assets in both of those. So the Boulder lab is where most of what I just talked to will be. We did um, obtain a small 7700 storage system. And what I plan to do with that is actually split that so that I have a Lustre solution on one half of it and a GPFS solution on the other half. The nice thing about that is that I will have apples to apples comparisons. And then if I want to do tests with one or the other that are full, we can reconfigure it and build one or the other across the whole, the whole system. So that's one of the things that I was very fortunate to be able to get out of my money last year. And then the last thing I'd like to point out is in our lab in Cheyenne, we always buy a small test system that goes along with all of our production systems. And so that gives us a little bit larger system that we can drive things with. So this is where we're doing some of our NVMe research. And you'll notice that we have a DDN IME in there. That system was originally connected to the older IBM system. And we had some issues with the structure of that network to really support it. So we're very excited to connect that to the SGI system with the Hypercube, where we have enough network bandwidth to really drive it. And that's going to actually be reconnected. That system is now available, and it's going to be reconnected next week to get this research going again. So we have that little mini environment there. We've got a whole test environment in Boulder that we get to do fun things with. And so we're looking forward to testing some of this and pushing some of this a little bit beyond what we've been able to do in our production environment and see what our future begins to look like. So with that, here's our. these are our main things we're working with these days. And I, you can see we put... DDN up there because that's my world and that's where I enjoy doing things. So I will leave it with that. Okay, I've just been told I have time for questions. So, yes. Uh, 
Um, you'll notice that in our test environment, we do have OmniPath. And we have been doing a lot of work of can we support OmniPath and IB in the same system at the same time. And that's actually what we would need to do to bring it into the Glade environment. So we do have ideas and we do have enough hardware now that we can start to play with that. Um, having gone with the embedded system is going to complicate that because we will probably have to bridge that network as opposed to being able to have adapters within the same systems, which is how we do it in our test lab today. But OmniPath is definitely on our map. We have um, some systems that we're probably procuring next year that very likely OmniPath may be it. So we will have to solve that problem. Yes? So obviously we've used Spectrum Scale for a lot of years. Um, it works very well with the types of codes that we run. Our codes don't run as well on Lustre as they do on Spectrum Scale because we have a lot of tiny I.O. Um, even though the models produce a large file at the end, they use little bitty files to do a lot of the work. So until the models really progress to where they're using the file systems in a more reasonable manner, probably in our environment spectrum scale for our large environment is a little bit better option. Where we've used Lustre very successfully is in our test environments. And um, the place that we're really looking at that going forward is multi-core systems. Because the codes have to, the way the codes have to run on those, they'll have to fix their I.O. So I think both of them are very valid. We've had very good luck with both. And it's really just dependent on your application that you're trying to run. Yes. So the central storage is the strategy. There is no storage outside of this environment. So every computer that we bring in plugs into here. So the movement is from file system to file system. So a lot of people, they'll work in Scratch for the, we have a very liberal Scratch policy. We just reduced it to a 45 day purge policy. And we were 90 days when we first built this environment. We will probably go back up when we map in this newer storage just because we'll have the capacity. So a lot of people get all of their work done in Scratch. They don't have to actually move data to ever finish it. The project spaces are for the people that have longer term. So a lot of the data analysis work Work. They need the data there for six months, a year. They get a project space. So once it's produced, they'll move at that one time, and then they work on it. The other beauty of the project spaces is that they're shared by groups. So in the old days, we, had, we would find that people would have the same data set 10 and 15 times on the file system. So now they get a project space. Somebody is responsible for keeping the data in place, and then everybody that wants to use it uses it. So that's really our strategy. If you need to move the data elsewhere, then that's where our Globus and our data transfer systems come into play into play. Grid FTP has proven to be amazing for moving between systems. We use it locally. We don't, it's not even moving it outside of the site, even though that is really, they do a lot of that. But we use it internally just because it's so much faster. Do we have, I think we've got one over there. Like 0.2% something like that of your entire like file storage is that correct? I, I'm not exactly sure what the percentage is. I know that we have to be careful to have enough because we do have we will have millions of under 4K size files. Yeah, so that's, that's why I'm a little bit worried <laughs> yeah. if you it would run out of your iNodes. Yeah, so essentially when we bought this new system, we looked at our current system. And then we just, we scaled it based on the scale in the, in the capacity. We didn't go that much different in capacity, so it was not difficult to scale it. Now what's going to get interesting is I'm actually going to buy more SSD because we're scaled perfectly right now for the new storage with the metadata, but we're going to tier the old storage. So I now have to accommodate the old storage capacity for metadata. All right. But it's not difficult, and, and again, with the policy engine in GPFS, you can do a scan of your file system within five minutes and you can get the whole profile. So what we do is every few months we actually run a new profile of our file system just to see that we're, we're good. It's a little scary. This is the first time in a long time that we've had the metadata separate. So when you mix your metadata and data, you don't have to care because it just uses the storage you have until you're out. So this is, this is um, this new system we're going to have to 
pay attention to that through time. So we run that scan every few months and just make sure that we're on track with that. But our, um, in GPFS, if you're not familiar with GPFS, you set a block size, but it has a, a sub-block size that's 32 of, of that to get to a block. And the majority of our data is under the sub-block size. So. Thank you. My screen says time is up, so do you want to stop or do you want to take one more? Are we good? Four one one. We have not considered that. We do compression with our backups, and we do compression. We have some of our data sets. Um, NetCDF is a data format that we use extensively, and it has the ability to do compression. And we're beginning to have users using that within their own data set. But we've not looked at data compression on the file system itself. So. Thank you. So much. Thank you.